All good? There you go. So, um, if you would get a copy of God's Word in front of you, uh, we'll, we'll be back in the book of Isaiah where we were before. Isaiah chapter 9. And a uh, quick little uh, poll this morning. Are you or anyone in your house currently sick? Raise your hand. It, it is, uh, I, I cannot remember a season in which people were dropping like flies. I mean, families just, you know, wiped out. The, the, the flu bug hits one, and then it just takes out the rest. Um, we took the girls in for their annual physical, and uh, I walk out with a prescription because my daughter has strep throat, which we didn't know going in. Uh, now, of course, the upside is uh, it was the annual physical, so we didn't have the copay. So, you know, praise God for that. Um, it's small victories that we celebrate. I, I need you to, as we uh, get started today, I, I want to invite you to share with the person next to you. Listen, I know this is dangerous territory, but we're going to go there anyhow today. Um, I want you to turn to a person uh, next to you, behind you, in front of you, wherever it is, and I want you to answer this question. What frustrates you the most about government? Go. What is, talk to the person next to you. What is it that frustrates you the most about government? Now, I'm smart enough to know when to cut this off, or this first service uh, will not have the sermon begin for another 45 minutes. There is a reason that I invited you to do that. Uh, the, we were talking about the greatest Christmas verse of all times, Isaiah chapter 9, verse 6 says, to, for to us a child is born, to us a son is given, and look at these next words, and the government will be upon his shoulders. And he will be called Wonderful Counselor, Mighty God, Everlasting Father, and Prince of Peace. Last week, we looked at the first part of it. And, 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 and there's always been this sense in us that when we read this first part, it's like, for to us, a child is born. To us, a son is given. And I hope that as we looked at the condition of our sinful nature, that perhaps from here on out, you are ruined for reading it that way. That maybe now you'll go, to us, a child is born. To us, a son is given. We would see our depravity and how divinity was willing to come and enter into and redeem our depravity. Today I want to talk about this idea that the government will be upon his shoulders. You know what's interesting? In a lot of the Christmas cards that we uh, send to one another, if it has this verse in it, the section and the government will be upon his shoulders is oftentimes omitted from those Christmas cards. Interesting, isn't it? That as the person opens it up, it's like, oh, it's so beautiful. For, you know, to us, a child is born. To us, a son is given. And he will be called. And we miss this section. And I think part of the reason we miss this section, people go, I, I don't know what to do with that section. And, 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 and it doesn't you know, evoke you know, this like wonderful you know, Christmassy scene sort of thing. It's almost, it's almost treated like a throwaway phrase. And yet this is part of the uh, announcement of the coming Messiah. What surprises me is that we throw this section out in verse 6, when in verse 7, this same theme is carried on. Verse 7 says, of the greatness of his government and peace, there will be no end. He will reign on David's throne and over his kingdom, establishing and upholding it with justice and righteousness from that time on and forever. The zeal of the Lord Almighty will accomplish this. And so clearly this is an important topic if it continues on in verse 7, yet we typically only read verse 6 in uh, inside our Hallmark Christmas cards, and it takes that section out. Last week, we said that if we're going to appreciate 
good news, we need to be able to sit with the bad news. You know what that is today? I'm going to talk about politics. Are you ready? I, 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 just just kind, of, kind of buckle up for that. And, and there is a sense in which some of you are going, Brian, you are going where angels fear to trot. You know, I mean, do you... so why don't we, why can't we discuss politics in, in, our, in the public forum? Why, why, why can't we? And, and more specifically, why can't we do that in here? Why, why is it that when we come here, we can't do that? And I think a large reason why we cannot do that is because we protect our views at all costs. We want to hold on to it. We don't want anyone to threaten that which we hold dearly with a legitimate argument, with a uh, concern, with an observation, anything that could dethrone our view, we push back on. That's called the idolatry of ideology. I cannot, I will not be moved from this position. Therefore, I won't engage with you at all, and if I do engage with you at all, I will treat you with contempt. I will use one-liners that are designed to minimize and neutralize you. I don't want to really hear what you have to say. I want to uh, uh, impress upon my view. And if you don't receive that, I'm going to ridicule you. I'm going to minimize you. I will mock you on social media. Inside the church of Jesus Christ, there are no Republicans, there are no Democrats, there are no Independents, there are no other thing. The label that transcends every other label must be child of God. That is, if you and I are going to be under the lordship of Jesus Christ, we cannot subsequently be under the lordship of a political ideology at the same time. Every political ideology needs to be left out there when we come together as the body of Christ. We submit to the lordship of Jesus Christ, not what our political ideologies want to convince us is true. So today I want to spend a little bit of time and I want to talk about what's wrong with government. See, I told you, like no one's sleeping today. <laughs> and, and, and at the same time, listen, I'm aware, it has never been more in vogue to rip on government than it is today. I mean, everybody is doing this. It's, it's almost like a sport is there anybody out there that you know that's going, man, government, I love it, and it's humming on all cylinders right now. Couldn't be better across the board. Nobody sees it that way. I want to spend some time instead talking about what I believe to be in inherent flaws in government and, and how that's never going to change. To do that, I want to answer this question, what's wrong with human government? And in trying to answer what's wrong with human government, I want to take you to uh, the um, Constitution to do that. But first, let's begin with this thought. The system is broken. The system is broken. And when I say broken, it's like a broken down piece of equipment where it, it just, it, it, you, you, you just want to walk away from it. Uh, three or four years ago, I, I finally had enough of my lawnmower. You ever had that, uh, uh, I, uh, that Popeye moment? I've had all I could stands and I can't stands no more. It died on me for the last time. I got off of it. I kicked it. I called it names. I got in the car and I drove and got a new one. I was done, you know? And, 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 and that, that's kind of like, our, 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 our system of 
government. It is broken and broken down. And I want to show you that from the document that we lift up to elevate this government that we have. The words start out, we the people, in order to, and then the phrase is, to form a more perfect union. There was a belief that there was a lot of power that could happen for the good in us if and when we work together. Can I just ask you a question? How are we doing at working together? How's, how, how's that going? And while it may be clearer today that it's not working, I would submit to you that years ago it wasn't working then. Uh, we just have more access to see how well it's not working today. We the people, in order to form a more perfect union, uh, uh, the, the phrase established justice is in that preamble. Romans chapter 13 tells us uh, that the primary purpose of government is to make sure that wrong gets punished. God's word makes it very clear. That is the primary purpose of government, to ensure that wrongs are punished. Let me ask you this question today. How many wrongs do you see go unpunished? How many people are getting off on technicalities? How many people are receiving a sentence disproportionate to somebody else who has a different bank account or a different skin color? Amen. We see it all around us. We the people, in order to form a more perfect union, establish justice, and then this phrase, to provide for the common defense. The framers of the Constitution had in mind that there would be a militia that would be in place, so if someone were to attack us, we would be able to defend ourselves. It is inconceivable that the framers of the Constitution had in mind that we would have a military presence all over the world. And, and we go, well, why do we do that? Because everybody else is doing it too. <clears throat> Form a more perfect union, establish justice, provide for the common defense, uh, secure the blessings of liberty. The framers of the Constitution uh, wanted to protect personal freedoms. That is, a person would have the freedom to be able to self-determine. You would be able to determine what was in the, uh, in the best uh, interest of yourself. And yet, I don't care where you land on the political spectrum, one of the things that frustrates us so much is the government tells us what to do. Here's what you have to do, and here's what you can't do. And depending on where you lean politically, you may go, ooh, that's good. We, we, we should have that. But, but that doesn't work so good when it's on the other end and the person's in office that you don't like. It doesn't agree with your ideology. And they go, well, we're all, you're all going to do this or you all can't do this. And you go, well, what's up with that? Next, this idea of promoting the general welfare. It was a broad purpose of Government. It has this idea in mind that no individual uh, could do something at the expense of the common good. That, that there was this belief that we is greater than me. We need to put the greater good of our nation ahead of ourselves. And look at where we are today. I will do what I want, when I want, how I want, wherever I want, and your, your job is not to ask the question, is this okay or not? Your job is simply to affirm whatever I want to do, whenever and however I want to do it. And then lastly, this idea that we would ensure domestic tranquility. The idea was that uh, the government was there uh, to uh, provide for order in our society. 
that, that the government's purpose was to promote domestic peace. When you look at government today and the way they behave and function, do you think they're promoting domestic peace or domestic dysfunction? And again, I don't care where you land on the political aisle. If you, if you listen to me today and you go, oh, yeah, yeah, Brian's, he lines up here, or he's, 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 he's speaking from this perspective, then you miss the whole thing. I'm, I'm talking about the this, this system of government. So um, not only is the system broken, but, but within our own uh, political system, we've got three branches of government. There's this thing called the executive branch, where uh, that involves the president. You got the legislative branch, which involves Congress, and you got the judicial branch, which involves the courts. And there's supposed to be some sort of a balance of power in there. But have you ever noticed that that um, this this uh, I almost think of the balance of power kind of like a pie chart. And do you ever notice that at certain times, in certain ways, certain groups have a bigger piece of the pie? than others. We've got uh, the, the presidential veto power. Congress has the uh, ability to uh, overrule a veto. And then you bump into this thing called the Supreme Court. And I'm not you know, trying to rail on anything, but let's just think for a moment. Um, there is no recourse if the Supreme Court says this is what's going to happen. It, it, it just is at that point. Some examples of brokenness within our government. There have been times where um, a state, uh, even a nation, has had an opportunity to speak into something and to vote and say, we overwhelmingly believe that this is what we need to do, only to have a court system come in uh, say, and a Supreme Court and go, uh, no, you're wrong, we're going to do this, and overthrow the will of the people. Another example of brokenness to me is, why are we stuck with a two-party system? Why is it that you either have to be a Democrat, a Republican, or filthy, stinking rich to even have an opportunity to have your voice matter in our political system? How did we get to the place where we have those few choices? It's, 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 it's emblematic of our brokenness. We have a government that operates and functions in a way that we in our home could never get away with functioning. Have you ever tried just printing more money at home? <laughs> if you have, they will find you. They estimate that our uh, national deficit, that each living person is in debt $65,000. Every single American, $65,000 to cover our national debt. And it doesn't matter which side of the political aisle is in government, we seem to always find ways to spend what we don't have. Does it work in your home? But somehow we find a way to do that in politics, in our government. And then, then to justify it, we blame the other side. Well, if only the Democrats, if only the Republicans, if only the independents, we wouldn't be in this mess that we are in. Part of the dysfunction of government is everyone who serves in it, it appears, it appears has a Ph.D. in blaming. When is the last time that you heard a government official take ownership for something? Next thought. Uh, the motives are suspect. There's a general feeling of disconnect between those in government and those who are not, and those of us who are not feel like those who are in government, they act in the interest of themselves, not in the interest of other people. And so we have a, 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 a term called earmarks. Maybe you've heard of that. And, 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 and earmarks is when uh, a politician 
is able to earmark government spending for a specific project that would benefit their community and or, more specifically, uh, benefit them. Again, it doesn't matter what side of the political aisle we come from. Can we all agree with this? If you go into Congress, Senate, whatever it is, and, and, and you're making $150,000 a year, how is it that in three years you've left Congress and you now have 4 or $5 million in your bank account? I mean, how is that? How does that happen? I mean, that doesn't, work, that doesn't happen in your job, does it? You know? Does it happen to mine? But, but somehow, you know, they, they go into government with a modest income and they come out filthy, stinking rich. And, 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 and there's, there's no disclosure of where and how that money came from. In fact, the only thing that we've gotten really good unfortunately, at disclosing when people are in government or come out of government, it's not how they made their money, but of the sex scandals that took place while they were there. Somebody should be thinking right now, why doesn't this get fixed? How, 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 how come this keeps happening? Why don't we do something about it? And the reason we don't do anything about it is because the people who can do something about it don't do something about it because they are the ones who benefit from it. Rarely, if ever, does somebody fix a problem when the problem benefits them. I mean, when's the last time you go, well, this is a, this, I, I see a problem, but if you are benefiting from it, what, what impetus do you have to fix it when you are benefiting from it? We just don't typically do that. And then we're somehow surprised when those in politics do the same. You've heard me say before that ultimately at the end of the day, the greatest and the biggest and the darkest problem with government is this. They're a reflection of us. Not, not only did we put them in office, but they are subject to the same temptations and potentials and sins and propensity to self-centeredness, self-righteousness, and the use of power to the benefit of themselves, just like we are. We're committing the same sins that they commit every other day in just in other ways. Government, newsflash, in case you didn't know this, uh, government is made up of sinful people with a sinful heart. And sinful people with a sinful heart vote for sinful people with a sinful heart to go and represent them in government. And we give sinful people with a sinful heart power to make decisions over us. And when you give power and money to sinful people with a sinful heart and the ability to make decisions uh, that benefit other people or benefit themselves it's like giving alcohol and a and, and a sports car to a teenager and saying good luck all of that to say some of you are like keep going pastor i like it because we're not gonna spend all day there but all that to simply say this unrighteousness is the rule of the day in government because you have unrighteous people in government. And I don't care if we put everybody in there who uh, aligns with your viewpoint, that reality will not change. And so long as there are unrighteous people in government who are making the rule of government, we will have, no matter what system you put in place, no matter how good it looks in theory, listen, our form of government is superior to many other forms of government out there. But at the end of the day, there is no perfect form of government that will work when you put imperfect people in it. And so unrighteousness will be the rule of the day. And, and at the same time, not only do we have this, but, but in the last 15 to 20 years, we have this new phenomenon of the 24-hour news cycles. 
And see, I, I, I'm not in your house, so I don't know what you do. So I can say this, and you can't go, Pastor's looking in my window. I'm not in your house. I can just tell you, I believe it is an absolute cancer to your soul to spend all day watching 24-hour news cycle. I don't care what side of the political aisle you're on. Their purpose is not to inform you. Their purpose is to inflame you. There is not civil debate allowed. It is our position is right, and now let's spend some time mocking and ridiculing and questioning those who would think differently. And we serve, we celebrate at, 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 at Christmas time and, and hopefully throughout the rest of the year that Jesus Christ is the Prince of Peace. And what sort of promotion do you see on 24 hours news cycles about peace? It's ridicule, it's blame, it's shame. It is designed to stir contempt in you for those who don't agree with your point of view. And it's morphing you, it's changing you, it's shaping you, and you don't see it. The bad news today, guys, government, any government on, of any kind, will not work over the long haul. As noble of an institution that it is, it will fall short through the execution of unrighteous and sinful people. Another way of saying it is this. Power in the hands of sinful people will always lead to a broken down system no matter how good that system may be. And so you got to ask yourself the question, so what is the solution? Is it to overthrow the government? I don't think so. Is it to grow a mullet and go join the Michigan militia? I don't think that's going to work for you either. God says that we need leaders. God says that we need authorities over us. And God's word says that if we don't have authorities over us, we would be experiencing worse than we're experiencing today. So who's going to fix it? The solution is Jesus. Amen. Look with me again. Isaiah 9, 6. For to us a child is born, to us a son is given, and the government will be on his shoulders. Now, Isaiah, the prophet, remember, he, he, he's, he's speaking. God is giving him a picture of what is to come not what has happened yet. And the picture that God is giving him is what I would refer to as the mountain peaks of the Messiah. Have you, have you ever um, been somewhere, maybe it was the, um, the Smoky Mountains or the Rocky Mountains somewhere, and from a distance you see these mountains and they look so close together from a distance. But the closer that you get, the farther apart they are. So when you, when you observe something from a distance, that which has a great distance between them seems awfully close together. And this is what's happening here in Isaiah's prophecy. Because Isaiah is prophesying not just the first advent, but the second advent as well. Do you know that we only tend to separate, uh, celebrate the first advent and forget all about the second? Advent. The first advent of Christ is his appearing. It's, it's Christmas. It's what we're celebrating now. But the second advent is the return of Jesus Christ. But because Isaiah was seeing the mountaintops of the Messiah from a distance, he saw them together, and he just saw this and this one together, and he puts both of them together in Isaiah chapter 9, verse 6. He didn't see the separation between the two. And, and the disciples didn't either. They thought when, when Jesus Christ showed up, all right, let's kick Rome out, let's get it on, and now we're going to reign and rule over this whole thing. They couldn't see the separation. They thought Christ was there to take government away. And so the first advent, God sends a Savior. That's mountain one. And mountain two, God's sending a king who's going to fix this whole thing. Now, so for to us a child is born, to us a son is given, mountain one, and the government will be upon his shoulders, mountain two. Isaiah is 
talking about through chapters 7 and 9, uh, speaking about how King Ahaz uh, is looking to Syria and saying to, basically to Syria, Syria, help! Save us from the other nations that are coming, to against, coming against us. And so Isaiah's message uh, from chapters 7, 8, and 9 essentially are, hey guys, you need to trust God and not human government to save you. And, and the reason why is that government will not save the day and they will not save you because when you have unrighteous, sinful people who serve in government, here's, here's the dirty underbelly about government in general, government eventually will always deteriorate to serving themselves first when push comes to shove. It is a byproduct of having sinful people leading sinful people. Have you ever noticed whenever it's an election year, every politician wants to tell you how they're going to save the day. I'm going to do this, and I'm going to do this, and I'm going to do this. And the, their basic message is, I see everything that plagues our society, are the, all the ills, and if you will elect me, I will save the day. I will fix this. I will save that. And we believe them, provided, provided they fit our political viewpoint. If they line up with us, we got a spoon and we're eating it up. But if it doesn't, no, you can't do that. That'll never work. And we disagree with them and we wrestle with them all the time. But we, we, have, we keep falling over and over and over again into the trap of believing that they're going to somehow save the day. In many ways, we, we saw that when President Obama ran for office. It was going to be hope and change, hope and change. I see what's wrong. I see incivility. I see brokenness. I see all this. And if you elect me, I will fix it. I will bring hope, and I will bring change. And people believed that that was going to happen, that he was going to be able to save the day. And, 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 and listen, he was not our Savior. Jesus is. Let's come to today. And a number of born-again Christians say, we've got God's man in the White House. Hear me well. God's man sits at the right hand of the Father. He does not sit in the Oval Office Amen. at any point in human history. And it is blasphemous to utter anything other than that. In 1979, in an attempt to try to somehow um, leverage governments to save the day, to fix the day, there was the formation of this thing called the moral majority. It was evangelical Christians who were going to use politics to reverse uh, immorality in our society. And they tried to Christianize the nation through a political context. Jerry Falwell, the, fo the founder of this, said, quote, we're going to get them saved baptized, and registered to vote. And, there, and, and the attitude was that, that government was going to be the solution, and so pastors and church leaders were registering voters at the expense of preaching the gospel. And in the end, Christians gave multi-million of dollars to back a political move to change society through legislative means. In May 2010, a Gallup poll was released after the moral majority had been almost exclusively dismantled. And here's what they found. Everything that the moral majority tried to change was worse today than it was when they started. In fact, every area of immorality increased during the time that the moral majority was in place. The, the unintended consequence of the moral majority is a, somehow a creation or association between Christianity and those who have a political bent towards conservatism. That if you were one, you had to be the other, and you couldn't be if you weren't one of those. And the truth of the matter is that if the majority of people want immorality, it's going to happen. And it will hasten the judgment of God on our land. But it will happen. 
Now, it's not wrong to vote. It's not wrong to rally voters. It's not wrong to run for office. We need noble people in those places. What is wrong is for the church of Jesus Christ to somehow believe that that is where the solution is. And we give more time and emotion and money to that than we do the Lord Jesus Christ. Someday, the Bible says, the government will be on his shoulders. Now, I've just spent the last few minutes telling you how, the, how, how, our, how our government and any government in any place is broken. It, it simply is inadequate. It can't do what needs to be done. It's insufficient. It's not strong enough. It's not competent enough to do it. And so the Bible says that, uh, and one day, uh, uh, the government will be on his shoulders. Shoulders are a sign of strength. Put your shoulder into it. Um, they can't shoulder that. You need, to, you, need a, you need a shoulder to lean on. So it's a picture of strength. And it's saying that one day Jesus Christ is going to have this, he's going to come and return, and with his strength, he will be able to carry the government on his shoulders. In other words, things will get a lot better. It, it, it reminds me, uh, summer before last, um, we took the girls to Disney, if you've ever been there, you, you, you know what that can be like. And uh, we wanted to see, uh, I say we, I was told, um, we wanted to see the fireworks uh, you know, out front of the Magic Kingdom one night. And so you've got a sea of people that are all around there. I mean, it, 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 you're packed in like sardines. And then when it's done, you have to take the hundreds upon hundreds upon hundreds of people and funnel them like rats out these few doors. And I've got a four-year-old that's trying to hold my hand. Now, I want you to imagine what it must be like for a four-year-old when you are squeezed in by all these people. You can't see daylight. You can't see anything. Your, your, your daddy's holding on to your hand, and that's helpful, but you, 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 she, she, she did not have what she needed to get out. She was stuck. But things changed for her in a moment. I let go of her hand, snatch her under her arms, and I pluck her on my shoulders. And I wasn't the tallest guy there, but at six foot two, I'm one of the taller ones. You stick her on top, and now I look like I'm seven foot. Now she can see. I, I had the str- my shoulders had the strength to carry her when she did not have the strength to carry herself that situation. And it's a beautiful picture of Jesus Christ looking at, you know, our government is, 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 is the four-year-old. Well, I think we can do this. I think we can do this. I think we can do this. And Jesus is going to come along and go, no, you can't. Whoosh, I got you. I'm your savior. You're not. I will carry you. What, what the government is unable to do, Jesus will do one day. When it's, and so the implication is, if, if the government will be upon his shoulders, that he is strong enough to carry the government, he's strong enough to carry you, and you, and you, and me. In other words, someday things are going to get a lot better. If you're here today and you're a follower of Jesus Christ, do you know that your, that your eternal zip code is more prevalent and more real to Jesus Christ than your temporary zip code right now? You are citizens of heaven. And the moment you said yes to Jesus Christ, you became a citizen of heaven, and you are now a, uh, a foreigner in a foreign land. This is not your home. And yet politics invites us to act as if this is our home. The kingdom of Jesus Christ is mysterious in nature, but it's not that mysterious if we just read God's word. It'll tell us a little bit of what it's like. And in fact, verse 7 gives us some glimpses of what we may, what we will see in Jesus' kingdom when he returns to reign on earth. Look at verse 7. Of the greatness of his government and peace, there will be no end. I cannot wait for the day when I no longer have to pick the lesser of two evils. Where, 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 Where voting will no longer happen. Where we don't have to worry about term limits. None of that. When Jesus Christ returns, 
he returns to rule and reign. And he doesn't have to have a vote to say, okay, hey, <clears throat> uh, I'd like to uh, run as uh, king of the universe. Uh, so we're going to have a vote coming up. Um, I'm willing to have a debate with anyone that needs to, and then I'm going to trust that you guys are all going to vote for me in the end. When Jesus Christ returns, everybody will realize who he is, and he will be in that moment king, and he will rule, and he will reign. And here's the beautiful thing. Of the greatness of his government, and, and there's that word, and peace, there will be no end, which means the more he rules, the more you'll want his rule. There's not going to be broken promises or dashed hopes. When he comes as king, he will be king forever. And, and, and why it's so important to talk about that this time of the year is because of the first advent tells us about the coming of Jesus. And because we know 2,000 years ago that that was accomplished, that the accomplishment of the first advent promises the, that there will be a second advent, that if Jesus Christ can come as baby, then we know he will come again as king. And that is our hope. Amen. And we wait for that. It's a kingdom of permanence. Secondly, it's a kingdom of promise. Verse 7, he will reign. I love it. Not We hope. Not if the votes are there. He will reign. In verse 7, on David's throne and over his kingdom, establishing and upholding it. The, the phrase there, on David's throne, is significant because God promised a Messiah. As early as Genesis 3.15, where it reads, And I will put enmity between you and the woman and between your offspring and hers. He will crush your head and you, talking about Jesus, will strike his heel. From Abraham, thousands of years ago. Don't miss that. Thousands of years ago, Jesus said, I'm going to make you a promise. And when a politician makes you a promise, you go, eh, well, we'll see. Jesus said, I'll make you a promise. I will have a king come. And, 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 and the promise was that, uh, as, as it became a little fuller and clearer to us, that when David was the king, that the promise would be that the, that the king to come would come from David's line. That's where the Messiah would come. And so Abraham, so far back, and then you know, hundreds of years before David, and then after David, hundred more, hundreds of more years. And then Luke chapter 1, verse 32 and 33. He will be great and will be called the Son of the Most High. The Lord God will give him, here it is, the throne of his father, David. And he will reign over Jacob's descendants forever, and his kingdom will never end. Oh, I want you to hear that today. God made a promise thousands of years ago. And it came to pass. And if God can make a promise that far back and ensure that it happens, then you can go to bed with your head on the pillow tonight and know that every promise God has ever made you in his word, that he has the power to see it come to pass. And not only does he have the power to make it come to pass, he has the will and the desire to make it come to pass. Next, it's a kingdom of perfection. A kingdom of perfection. Verse 7 again, of the greatness of his government and peace, there will be no end. He will reign on David's throne and over his kingdom, establishing and upholding it. Here is with justice and righteousness from that time on and forever. Righteousness. Everything the king, the ruler does will be right. And there will be justice. Justice means that wrong is punished immediately. We, we live in a, in a day and a time where you can get mistrials and you can wait years for trials and then all these people can get off on technicalities. Under the reign and the rule of the Lord Jesus Christ, there will not be any Casey Anthony situations where everyone goes, what just happened? How did this person get off? When we pray the Lord's Prayer, we say, thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. And when Jesus is king, that's exactly what's going to happen. 
Do you know that when Jesus Christ is king, you're not going to go, oh, should we turn on the 10 o'clock news? You can't wait to turn on the 10 o'clock news when Jesus is king. It's going to be so full of great stories. All the stories will have righteousness, justice, and peace littered throughout them. And then lastly, it's the kingdom of power. The greatness of his government and peace, there will be no end. He will reign on David's throne and over his kingdom, establishing and upholding it with justice and righteousness from that time on forever. Here it is. The zeal of the Lord Almighty will accomplish this. It's not just going to happen because God can. It's going to happen because he wants it to happen. Zeal is like, this is my passion. This is my desire. This is what I want to see come to pass. No one wants this coming kingdom more than Jesus does. You're like, oh, Brian, did you talk about this? Oh, I would so love to be under the reign of Christ in this way. As much as you desire it, he desires it more. Why does he wait? Why not come right now? Why does he wait? He's waiting for you. He's waiting for your spouse. He's waiting for your children. He's waiting for your grandchildren. The Lord is patient, not wanting anyone to perish, but all to come to eternal life. And so you could spend the time between this mountain and this mountain complaining, Moaning, griping, debating, politics. Or maybe you could just realize that there is another advent that is coming, and the only reason it doesn't come right now is because the Lord is patient, not want anyone to perish. And maybe, just maybe, we ought to spend a little bit more time trying to make sure that the people in our community, in our family, at our job, wherever we are, might actually come into this kingdom instead of trying to establish a farce of a kingdom right now through our own political ideologies. Christmas is about a savior. It's about the promised return of a king. And our hope is in the king, not in government. But I want to finish with this question. And it's, it's, a, it's a pointed question as our praise team comes up. If the average person had the ability to watch you, to observe you, to, to see what you to watch what you watch, to, to, to hear what you hear, to observe what, what you get passionate about, would they conclude that your hope is in Jesus or the government? But what do you spend more time studying? What do you spend more time reading? What do you talk about more? What do you invest in more? It's easy to say, oh, my hope is in Jesus as king, but if I don't give a dime to the kingdom, but I'm sending all this money to politicians, if I don't have, I'm sorry, Pastor, I just don't have time to read God's word. Well, how can you when you're watching Sean Hannity or Rachel Maddow or anything in between? Where is your hope today? And may we take this Advent season to come back again to the place where we say, my hope is in the King, the Lord Jesus Christ. Can we stand together? Father, I pray as we, as we stand and we prepare to lift our voice to you today, that we would sing as a people who believe that our, our hope is in you. There is no other alternative. All our eggs are in your basket. We sing in exaltation. We sing with repentance, going, God, I'm sorry. I'm sorry. I, I, know, I know it's about you, but I get so wrapped up about politics, so invested in government that we neglect the fact that you are the coming king. God, show us what does it look like to be citizens in this land, to, uh, to be willing to serve noble causes in noble ways, but yet hold it loosely, knowing that there is nothing we can do to stop unrighteousness. Only the Lord Jesus Christ has that ability.
So because you have this ability and we don't, we sing praise to you. We exalt you. Thank you that one day the government will be upon your shoulders. And I'm thankful that your shoulders are large enough that you've got room that we can be on your shoulders too. Carry us, Jesus, because we can't carry ourselves. In Jesus' name, amen.